turn on the mic? Yeah, you know it's me. Um, very welcome to this uh, eight o'clock show. Um, I'm extremely happy, obviously, that Antanas Mokos came. I will not introduce him more now because you will see about his work, and Joanna will introduce him. And um, but uh, we talked for a long time and about it, and uh, I didn't really believe that it would work out that you really come till you are here. So I'm really happy uh, to welcome you. And uh, Joanna Varsha will moderate the talk. Uh, the collaboration between uh, Antanas and Joanna started with the Berlin Biennale, where Antanas Mokus was invited as an artist. Um, maybe you talk about that later. So, but uh, So in a way, it's a continuation of a conversation for a while. And um, I don't want to waste more of your time and just hand over. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much uh, for coming. And thank you, Antanas, also for coming over from South America here. And uh, first, I will start with short introduction. And uh, I will say, as you know, there, there are two parts of our meeting with Antanas tonight. So first hour is here and we'll be, uh, because we just have one hour, so we'll, be try, to, we'll try to be quite concrete and um, respond to the certain context situations or tactics as strategies that Antanas have you, has, has used as a politician, as a mayor of Bogota, and then we will move to another space for those who want to continue where Antanas will hold a lecture about his methodology and what possibly other mayors of other cities maybe could share as an experience from his previous uh, political experience. So Antanas, you have been... Um, you have been the mayor of city of Bogota at the capital of Colombia twice in the 90s and also in 2001 to 2003. And uh, you are here, you are a mathematician, philosopher, you have been a dean of university and then you moved to the politics. So you are not one of these so-called professional politics, politicians. And uh, you are also, we are together here tonight because you are somebody who has treated art extremely seriously. And you are somebody who, who transported art in the realm of politics. So I remember when we were talking, you once said that you don't go to church to look for inspiration, but you go to the exhibition. And for us, I think in this context, in the context of this marathon of Truth is Concrete, it's extremely important. And also uh, Georges Schulet and, and Florian mentioned this earlier, that there must be this kind of chain reaction in the society in order for art to work. Because of course, we cannot expect from artists to solve all the problems if there are not other people, like politicians, namely, who take it over. And um, so you had this method of recontextualizing things, because actually what we expect very often from art is that art will show us things from different angles, that uh, artists are those who see things differently and can, they can recontextualize them. And I think this is also what you have been implying in, as a politician. And uh, you are actually, I think, performing the, the politics in the way that may, was making uh, us aware of a net of relations in which we are and that as citizens or as a political beings. And uh, so what I would suggest is that uh, we go through five or six examples from very concrete examples from your practice and then we talk about this and uh, we can maybe just start with a simple question. What, what made you actually interested in art and how did you put art in the politics? Well, thank you. I will put this here. Just a way of making a very simple example of recontextualization. Perhaps it's not productive, but it's at least strange. Um, I was in a family an engineer, a philologist, and a sculptress. And the sculptress won the influence battle. <laughs> For some years I was helping her in, with the material Your installing. Your mother was a sculptor. Yes, a sculptor. my mother. But mm -hmm. um, she is a sculptress. And uh, sometimes I think she should be in my place. But life is in that way. To some extent, she looked with this fiction to, rec to social rec recognition. And she stopped making exhibitions for about 20 years. 
and when she got back to exhibitions, when answered, if she was an artist, she answered, no, I am showmaker. I said to my mother, if you continue to answer things like that, you will be not recognized. You have to be more diplomatic. And my mother, in 24 hours, made a small sculpture that I will perhaps show at a certain moment. Uh, working as rector, as dean of the university, I learned that there are situations where rational argumentation is not effective. So you have to, to change completely. The, so sometimes I ask people to tie their hands. Imagine a very serious meeting in the university and suddenly with a tie, please, Joanna, or someone can give me a, a show tie. And with those elements, we change it routine. I was biking, a little bit fanatical of biking. So when I was appointed as rector of the university, the first meeting I was doing three turns around the big table. So the vice minister was like repenting, <laughs> like remembering. And a dean said uh, what the rector has just said is very hurting. I, and I show a, a wound here saying I'm also hurt. hurt but the main, the main responsible of my change in face of art were university professors. I was asking them, art professors, you can make the best art, but if you do not write rationally what you did, that's not for being uni university professors. And they were telling a lot of times a gesture, an image says more than a thousand words and we have not to be obliged to tell the secret. So the first activity that I made in the campus after being designed rector was going to the faculty of arts for a second conference in a sequence of two. And I was, I came in bike, I put the bike here, and I was saying, let me do the conference like that. <laughs> and for a quarter of an hour, I spoke to them as if I was with the psychoanalyst. <laughs> and they asked me, what would you do if you have some day to wear bulletproof jacket? And I said, if, if that day arrives, I will sell my bulletproof jacket and I will give money for education. Ten years later, I got the bulletproof jacket. I wanted to sell it. The police officer close to me said, it's not legal, it's not free market. You cannot sell that kind of thing. <laughs> so for one day, I put the bulletproof jacket under my shirt was menaced by the, by the FARC. The second day I said, I don't like this thing around me. So I will wear it outside and I take scissors. I had read a technical thing about uh, anti-bulletproof uh, bulletproof jackets. You can cut it very easily with a, a scissor. So I, <laughs> I made that and it was clearly a depiction of the FARC but it was also a message. Hey guys, try to seduce me. American ambassador liked it a lot to touch me and, and say, please put some metal. Well, okay. But no, because th this was, I think, what, what is interesting in this bulletproof jacket, that actually, of course, it means something if you cut a uh, heart inside it, but then if you are in the uh, dangerous, potentially dangerous situation, of course, you can be dead. And also, this symbol stopped to work in this moment. So, how did you actually? That was, and, and the violence was, I guess, one of the main issues when you started to work as a mayor of Bogota in the mid 90s. And you started also developing these programs of vaccination against violence and uh, the giving, exchanging arms and toys. 
could you tell about your your uh, your strategies towards dealing with violence and also later or we can show also some examples out of it well <laughs> this is <laughs> that was cooperation with a journalist. A TV program was helping a journal, a newspaper, El Espectador, to make a CV campaign. And uh, it was suddenly invited to dress like that. But this was the second session of photos with the same these guys. When I put for third time, a little bit irritated that a woman that was going through the street said, hey, mayor, please work. <laughs> and he, he had totally reason. I had worked a little bit about the idea of symbolic violence. Once in the French university where I was studying, I didn't operate the WC. A big French worker of the university came and said to me, eh, in your country, perhaps you can leave the WC like that. But here, I'm not for pushing the button of the WC. That night, I was crying because of two reasons. I had done a bad thing for Colombia, for Colombia's reputation. But also, I was asking myself how many years have to pass before a Colombian worker of university could say to the senorito, please push the button. So that worker was using symbolic violence against me. He was not thinking about hit hitting my body or hurting my body. So for many years I did pro propose more symbolic violence, less physical violence. But what concretely, like for example this, what, which kind of actions or procedures have you implemented then? Well, Because homicide rate has yes. dropped significantly. I think these are very uh, concrete yes. proofs of well, those Well, in, in the first security meeting I asked how many homicides there were. So someone said 3,000, someone 3,540. There were d d different numbers. So I get a little bit hungry and said, you have to work together for institutions to have a unique uh, cipher, and we will give to the public every month the, the, the cipher. One member of the council said, Mayor, don't be so upset. One third of these deaths are criminals that kill criminals. I said, what I hear? We authorities have to protect the lives even of the criminals. That was the peak moment of that meeting. I was invited to several meetings about car stealing and I said, as much as we don't make more seminars about protection of human life, I am completely disinterested of what happens to cars. <laughs> well, the, the assurance companies have all the right to make their meetings, but I will not go there. So uh, it was hierarchization. When we look at to the statistics, in the year, clearly December was the most violent month of the year. So it's very strange, it's, Colombia is very Catholic, and December is very violent. And Colombians don't sing too much, even in the church. But on December, the novena, nine uh, nights that finish on 23rd or 24th, are meetings of the family for singing, are praying. So the month where is the most praying was the more violent. So I said, it, it's not coherent. The, another day very violent was Mother's Day. <laughs> so I was very clearly uh, arguing that the best gift that you can give to your mother is staying alive. So please do not risk your life. We asked the military 
to forbid legal guns. The military sell the guns and they have the right to suspend the carrying of the guns. So you have to leave the gun in your, in your house. Through 20 churches, well, at a certain moment, the military didn't back us, said we'll sell the guns, so we have to allow people at least some months of the year carrying guns. With the, Arch the Archbishop of Bogota, we went the two to, to speak with the Minister of Defense. It was someone from the Jesuit University, and she had made a public speech about the monopoly of the use of the force by the military uh, corpuses. So we, with the Archbishop, we said, with this minister, we will have resistance to s selling the guns. The minister, there was a true quiproquo, an incredible quiproquo. The minister said, I'm sorry, but el cucharo, el, el palo no está para cucharas. The, the wood is not for making spoons. And we, several weeks later, made spoons of metal guns that were voluntarily taken by common citizens to 20 priests in, 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 in the city. Uh, there were only 2,600 guns, but on that December, we had 26% less homicides. But Antanas, what is it that makes people then be more open for resigning from having guns? Like, what, which kind of methodology is behind it? Like, how would you describe it? Well, perhaps the most simple statement is, I'm not a saint. I have dreamed of using violence also. I do understand, for example, that many people before killing suffer a sort of very strong humiliation feeling and I can say the day I mooned my students in the National University, I felt like you. Fortunately, I didn't have a gun in my hands. So there are a lot of criminal policies that are built on the idea that we are the good guys and they, they are the bad, horrible, uncurable guys. So. For me, pedagogy. For them, prison. Use of guns. Uh, but there was this moment that you also uh, took a glass of water and put it on the face of uh, other minister or, yeah, or your uh, colleague. Well, it's a temptation. Imagine. <laughs> imagine. But you did it actually. Why you did it? You did it to, to show that the violence can be sublimated or delegated or put on another level of human relations. And I think this was your strategy in this case, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think we were discussing with Peñalosa, another mayor of Bogota, very good in some work uh, he built a lot of things coherent with wh what we had done. The, the mass transport system of Bogota was built because I was mayor, he was mayor, I was mayor. But we were candidates in, in the first o occasion and he said sometimes for some questions the city needs a sort of spiritual guide or something like that. And I saw a little bit of water, and I, we were in the Jesuit University. Uh, so he received part of the water. And when I spoke, I spoke about cultural rules, and I spoke about reciprocity. They said reciprocity would be that Peñalosa put water on my face. In that moment, the audience said, yes, 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 Peñalosa. Uh, please, so he take a full glass and he put with a lot of energy in, on my face. I jumped like a, fo a football player. Absol I seated, I celebrated like that. And then I got to him and then embraced it. That night, a friend's daughter 
told her father, if politics is what I have shown this morning in the university, I would like to have a political career. <laughs> so we were playing. Here there is a priest. Well, <coughs> as you see, I have a mess, terrible problem with religion. Colombian is very Catholic. And uh, perhaps by influence of my daughter that is 16, I have been secularizing myself. So in the last elections, when people said, do you believe in God? I said, one moment, <laughs> let me think a little bit about it. Let, le let me state it carefully. People say, this guy doesn't believe in God. <laughs> so, and uh, even, well, during my mayorship, we had a lot of good initiative with Catholic Church. One of them was a substitution of fireworks by what we call symbolic fireworks. One of them was lipstick for men, only to use 28 December, the day of innocence. And uh, we also say the, the, the pants, yellow pants with carrot, like that or like that. Uh, and we put condoms. For the condom questions, I go to speak with the archbishop. I say, I'm going to distribute condoms. The instruction will be inflate them and, and make them explode. He said very beautifully, he said, the sin is not in the condom. So, in part, I am, well, Colombia had a very strong confrontations between liberals and conservators the classical violence. Some experts consider that that violence killed more than the last 20 years of fight with FARC, LN, and the narco-traffickers. Colombia didn't solve well its problem with religion. Well, <laughs> Antanas, let's, <laughs> let's, let's go through other examples also to uh, draw a landscape of your activities in different fields because uh, this is also from the turning uh, that, guns that's into... A, a perversion. The, the pleasure that I have in life, the vice is to destroy guns. In this case, it was with the permission of the military. But once I did it without permission of, of military and they were sending a letter explaining me the constitutional basis of their monopoly <laughs> of destruction of guns. So I can imagine a concourse where they say, we are have the right to destroy them. Yeah. And it would be beautiful that they win this concourse. This is vaccination against violence. Well, it, I, my team, showed me experimentally that children were more happy receiving the drops. But what was the vaccine against violence? It was a short procedure where a psychologist or a psychiatrist uh, asked the person who has hurt you the most in your life. Please draw his face on this balloon and we put the balloon on a body full of balloons, and now say or do him or her what you feel. For example, I was arguing with my mother. Mama, mano, kudel tu tape el guies, kudel tu tape dare. Well, I also, a second time I, I passed through it, I remember a professor that was hitting my, my legs because I had short uh, pand Pantalon. Uh, the third time I passed through the vaccination, I wanted to, to search more, not repeat. And I remembered a gallery owner, close friend of my mother, taking a Sunday to his gallery and saying, 
let me teach you some wrestling. And he was, he didn't get out uh, clothes, but he was making something from, for which I had no words. I had no categories. I could not understand. So when I get remembering this, I, I shout. I shouted him saying, Casimiro, si te gustan los hombres, if you like men, search adults. With the children, not. The journalists were asking, what was the surname of Casimiro? Let's, well, he's passed away. But so we tried non-conventional ways. Well, perhaps, well, in a certain moment, I can tell the, sto the yes. story before it. Let's maybe... Let's guide. Let, yeah, let's uh, stop about the violence, because we have also different strategies that maybe also are more uh, relative no. uh, to European context, where, uh, fortunately, mm -hmm. we don't have so much violence in, in South America. And uh, there is, uh, this is a building of one of the public libraries that were mm -hmm. also founded uh, during your term as mayor. And I met one of your collabor collaborators, uh, Holger Orlando Melo, who told me about a story that I really very much, that comes back to me all the time, that in these very um, dangerous and violent suburbs or districts of Bogota, you decided to open libraries. And then uh, when one was coming to borrow a book and was asking, uh, okay, so how do I have to enroll or which kind of document I have to say, to, to give to get this book. And Jorge was saying, no, we are just saying, you take this book, we trust you that you will return it. There is no subscription, we just trust you. And in this situation of kind of a narco-traffic, violence and, uh, and suburban circumstances, uh, actually an equal, equal number of books was lost as the books are normally lost in the other libraries where you have all these procedures of inscribing yourself, becoming member of the library. So what actually, what, what was it? And was it kind of strategy of building trust or what was the strategy that make this work in this case? Well, there existed few libraries in, in, in Bogota. The Luis Angel Arango one was having a lot of visits of students. So to some extent, people had many years the opportunity to read books in the bibliotheque. They couldn't carry them out. And Jorge Orlando Melo changed the rule. And for books that are not much needed, allowed people to take the books only by signing a, a, a paper, but not giving documents, not giving uh, warranty. And uh, amazingly, and that shows our pre prejudices, there were almost no, lo no loses. It's a beautiful example where trust ma makes its work. If you trust someone, the fear of losing the trust, well, receiving trust is very pleasant. It's delicious. It's, but losing, it's terrible. So you can regulate the, others, the other people's behavior by trusting. And also maybe it, it shows you know, that we are kind of a being who are very often afraid of a change. And if you accompany this change with affirmation or with the trust, then it's much, much more easier maybe to propose it or to implement it. I think this is what happened in this case. Yes, well I would stress an, an, an another aspect is people like a lot to have your destiny in their hands. Each time I made something a little bit strange, there were voices saying, Rector Payaso or Mayor Payaso. And uh, I was strongly exposed to be ridiculized to the end of my life. And strangely, people rescued me. Uh, 
when you write half of the sentence and give the people the ways of writing the other half, the people are very generous. And people know that there is a lot of common ground. And we have, sorry. No, okay. We have been talking also at the beginning, you were saying about recontextualizing. And uh, uh, one of the, I think, most fa famous examples and maybe most significant is this one with the mimes and maybe those who have seen, because actually it's possible to see a film, a docu Danish documentary about um, Antana's practice as a mayor called Bogota Change online on YouTube. You can, you can see it. And one of the stories which is quite <coughs> present there, it's also with the mimes. And uh, as, as far as I know, also talking to your, to your collaborators, uh, um, then that the mimes was an idea that you are going to work uh, as a mayor and then you have seen people who are doing this, performing this um, um, immobile um, sculptures in the streets. That somebody is embodying a, a, a figure and stands for eight or s six or seven hours. And you are, you are thinking, okay, like let them perform this work, but maybe let them at the same time contribute to the common good or the, the, to the share the common mm -hmm. sphere. And you have proposed the mimes, who are usually standing in the main squares of Bogota or other places, to go and control the traffic, even if you had the police. And of course you had a lot of problems with the traffic in, in Bogota back then, but like what, what kind of contribution the mimes brought that the police could not bring to this situation of uh, traffic control? Yes, well, there is in Bogota uh, one or two classical mimes that when someone is walking, the mime goes b back imitating his way of, 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 of walk. So they had some kind of, of uh, possibility of, of making criticism through imitation. But one of the ideas of the team of Cultura Ciudadana was allow mimes to control transit. Uh, red, red light, respect the, the crosswalk. And uh, when we announced the idea, well, the day where the mimes be began to work, there was a miracle. I didn't go to the place where they were beginning to, to work. Because if I had went there, I would be a sort of attention center, and perhaps I will be. Fall, I had fall in the temptation of making a bad mimes uh, role. So I was in the office, and the mimes were in the street. In that moment, beginning, and the first question of the journalist said, "The mimes will put fines." I said, "Sorry, the mimes cannot put fines." The journalist said in a beautiful manner, said, so it will not work. <laughs> and cha! Th that was the challenge. It's philosophy of right make, made concrete. Part of the society says, you can be educated without fear of punishment, of legal punishment. So it, it worked. So several weeks later, we had 400. But the, the first time, it was 20 mimes in 300 meter by 300 meter portion of Bogota. And the miracle of television. The television sh showed something very local, saying it's a sort of revolution. We, Bogota is crazy. <laughs> and for many months, there were a lot of criticism. The mayor is spending the money of the contributors in payasadas. Um, but which kind of, what did mimes appeal to? What they did differently? Was it well, if you a moral are, question? Or? No, it's... it's it's a, very, it's a very important question. I, well, normally you are an economical subject. An economical subject is where there is money. Where can I be more efficient? 
I'm staging here for a very slow uh, re economical recognition, so I'll alert. Uh, the art world is different from the CEO's world. So you are optimizers. So if a policeman says, please cross, do not cross, walk, do not jaywalk here, but go to the end of the corner and to the zebra cross and come here. You say, oh, policeman, I'm busy. I'm... But if it's a mime, first you stop and, and you estrange it. <laughs> and this guy cannot put fines. It's a guy without power. But he seems to be gracious, to, to, be, to express some kind of beauty. So in a certain moment, you, you say, he wants to say me something. He's good well, he's doing well or doing bad. So, and if I go, what would happen? If I do not go? So you change the, 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 the situation. It's a, well, once an unknown person was harassing one girl in a party. And the girl's uh, boyfriend just began to mimic, to make mimic of the harassment, of the acoso, with a, another guy. So the fear, the, the homophobia is so strong that very quickly the harassment of a man by a man become more important in the meeting <laughs> than the, the other. So sometimes you have the illusion that you understand what moves people. But the more general idea is Shlovsky. Shlovsky says that life becomes gray. The marriage can become gray. The profession can become gray. The house, the family can, tends to become great. So art has to recover colors, sometimes new colors. And society has art for that purpose. But Antanas, what you have been practicing, you were calling this sub-art. It's mm -hmm. not really art, it's sub-art. It's something that translates art into another sphere of society. What actually you mean by this term, sub-art? Yes, well, I am in a certain danger of being reinterpreted in a way that I will believe more than my own interpretations. I am a teacher, but some voices say you are an artist. So I say, let's approach a little bit, but please call what I do sub-art. What is sub-art? It's art perhaps, but without the pretensions of art. Well, I, it's beautiful because it's like putting a stamp. My mother was once invited to a women artist exhibition, and she made a, a stamp like the stamps for the coast, mujer, women, and she asked it at the entry the men to carry a piece of leather with the word mujer, women. And many very progressive colleagues of the university were saying, no, I, I cannot. No, I, I, please give me it, but I will take it here. <laughs> you, you can give back colors and you can create, in some sense, a sort of new situation or new... I, I had read some stuff about cultural reproduction. And many times what we do is very repetitive. How are you? Have, have you slept well? How do, did you travel? A, a lot of conversation is like respiration. The society speaks around us. To us, pardon. And sometimes you feel that you constructed a little bit something different. But perhaps 
very frequently is just an illusion. But the mo mo a moment's illusion can help to, to continue the journey. It's, uh, well, sometimes something happens with a certain strength. This is the reduction of deaths in traffic accidents. Maybe it's important to say that these mimes were also having a cards. Yeah, that they were giving kind of a, their own way of judging how you move in the system of traffic. Good. So the, they were good cards and bad cards, right? Or? Well, the mimes, not. But the citizens, the car drivers, were given a card. A card that was thought in, in binary system, but worked in four values system. You had white card with a finger like that. If another driver allows you to pass or stops where he has to stop, you make this. And if he did, does bad things like stopping the crosswalk, the cross between two roads, you make like that. 350,000 cards were distributed. Some people just had the card in the car. They didn't use just in that way, but a little bit like the man that has a gun here. But he <laughs> So the, this was an, a new armament. But some people used, for example, I know people from the industry that the moment in their life that they have felt the more shame is when another citizen has showed the car. And two, two weeks ago, I, I knew someone who was spilled, spouted, spit. escupido. Spit on. Spit on because of, but no one has been killed. But I think this, this statistic is an interesting example because as, as far as I know, there were many critics of your practice that this is maybe leftist populism or this is too uh, clownesque. But then, of course, when there is a hard, concrete statistics that shows that actually your politics is maybe appealing more to emotions and not only to the law regulations or translating these law regulations in emotions, then it becomes a very serious methodology or could potentially become a very serious methodology if this works, like, you know, yes. according to the... Two weeks ago, a, a police officer in Manaus, in a meeting between Brazilian local police and Colombian and Peru and well, the, the, the police that have to face uh, environmental problems, he said, Antanas helped us in the Colombian police to lose the fear of ridiculous. We allowed ourselves to, 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 to get out of the role of the classical uniform. 3,600 police officers were in three elite universities for one month full time, taking courses. And the, they had four subjects. The subject that they liked the most was called communication and creativity. If you are a police officer in Latin America, you need creativity, <laughs> communication for avoiding unjust use of force. Antanas, can we move to some, we have like 15 minutes and mm -hmm. three or four examples. Let's try to speak about those ones okay. more. Uh, no, let's, let's keep this one. Uh, sorry, let's keep this one and we maybe uh, talk about it later and uh, let's move to this what have you you have been practicing in recent years in your because mm -hmm. you have continued your political practice and in 2010 you have been uh, one of the two candidates for uh, a presidential elections in in uh, colombia and uh, you have decided to uh, to become a candidate only four months before the election so it seems like a crazy idea uh, and at one point uh, I saw it in the documentary, Green Wave. Uh, the statistics were absolutely raising and you had a lot of chance. And then they, they reached a point that somehow you 
became too orthodox in your methodology. Mm -hmm. You became too, uh, you became a leader that somehow in eyes, I, I think of, of some of majority, uh, they could not accept this kind of progressive thinking. Because one of the things you have been really um, stressing on is that in democracy, we don't need a figure of the leader. The democracy is us, and we have to understand to be in the system. And one of those examples, I think, this is the one with the chair, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of those examples quite well illustrated just happened in this TV studio. Could you describe this situation? Yes. <coughs> Sorry. That's a little bit sour. But uh, you see on the border, it's a chair, a sort of non, very authentic presidential chair. So my team asked me to, to sit on it and I feel a refusal, primarily an aesthetical one. But second, I think this is not even a cheap symbol of power. And I go to the cameras and say, here, in this, this is stronger. Or the cameraman has more power to the president. If the people that work in the cameras, do not they, their job well, they, well, the power will suspend television in the contemporary societies. It will be, so I say, let's propose my own idea about the, the thing that we are doing. And I searched where I had some light uh, behind, and I began to, to say the text, queridos colombianos, si ustedes quieren tenerme de presidente de la república, yo me ofrezco de muy buena gana. Y yo, I was filmed from there. So, my daughter, my oldest daughter said, uy, Antanas, you distract completely people. And uh, so the chair was empty, and the team says, what does, does it mean? And they said, well, the power is not exactly in the chair, and perhaps it could, well, I'm a little bit anarchist, you have understood. <laughs> well, peaceful one. Perhaps of cowardice, I prefer symbolic violence by far, but I think that everybody could help and could participate in a rebuilding of a society like, Bo like Bogotá's. I had, well, the, the, I don't know the words in, in, in English. In Spanish we say, candidato libreteado, well, if I had won the elections, imagine in this moment the dilemma. May I speak and say what I want to say? Or should I just follow the, inst the instructions? Perhaps some people are very good to improve the, inst the instruction. And myself, sometimes I have felt that pleasure. But but it seems like we are not ready to accept the, in the presidential campaign situation that stays, uh, that chair stays empty. Mm -hmm. We're not ready for that. And this was also the moment somehow in that in the statistics you started to yes. unfortunately lose against Santos. And also you have started to, uh, this was also one of the most interesting things of this campaign. At one moment you ask your opponent to run a campaign for you or you started to think how to run a campaign for him? Like, well, what was this? Th that was a logical issue. Very simple. I make campaign for you, you make campaign for me, and so, in some way, everybody wins. <laughs> and in my team, I asked permission to use one side of the papers for making campaign for Santana, for, for, for Santos, sorry. We can advertise him also a little bit. 
Yes, so one, one side this and the other side myself. <laughs> My best friend was saying, Antanas, it's too Machiavellic. <laughs> and I said, no, I think that it's the contrary. It's a communicative action. People had to know in an equilibrated way about the proposals. It's a communicative action disguised by strategic action. All my life I have had some difficulties with the word strategy. It comes from war. It's stratagema is a good way of taking advantage of some kind of of uh, engaño of, uh, of some kind of cheating. And uh, perhaps I have made also that kind of things many times to others. But in some sense, I instinctively resist in face of too much strat strategy. I prefer a society where we communicate freely. Uh, Gadamer has a, a beautiful sentence saying, the best conversations are not those which you lead the best conversations are those conversations that lead you and the other person. The conversation itself acquires some kind of life. Uh, yes, but uh, on the other hand, at the moment, you, are, uh, you have founded your organization, Corpo Visionarios, and it's a, an organization, a think tank, or do tank rather, I would say, which is advising other cities mostly, also city of Stuttgart, I guess, yes? And also other cities in <coughs> South and Latin America on somehow implementing. So this is still not completely a free uh, situation. You have built a, a methodology based on your practice as a mayor <coughs> and now. Well, the, the Council of Bogota said the mayor is going to spend a lot of money in Cultura Ciudad. So let's do some kind of inquiry of survey for measuring things to look if they change. Cultura Ciudadana, because we didn't introduce this term. No. It's a it's civic... Uh, civic culture or citizenship civic. culture. That was also uh, englobing your practice as a politician. Yes, well, in the first year of making campaign, I was asked what political group or what political identity do you have? And we said citizens that are forming ourselves to be citizens. If you are right or left wing, one moment. It's too early to ask that question. We have to respect lives. We have to respect the cities or the country's resources. Uh, Oh, I, I don't know, it, 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 at a certain moment, well, politics are very crazy when you have to say that you are the best guy in the town. It's, 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 a, it, it's not elegant. <laughs> and the journalist says, but you are sure that you are the best guy? <laughs> so, at a certain moment, I... I promised myself of doing politics if I could not say I'm the best of the guy. When we made the alliance with Garzón and Peñalosa, we began to make campaign together. In first moments, with a lot of envy. The, 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 more, the biggest group around, around Peñalosa. Or the young, bright student goes I was confessing envy. Envy is horrible to feel. But at a certain moment, Garzón took our heads together and to four citizens. He said, for whom will you, vo will you vote? The citizens were looking in, 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 in sequence who would suffer less or well, I imagine many considerations, but in that scene, the power to 
elect the power to select the best was given back to the people. A cartoonist made a very beautiful caricature. A lot of posters saying, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. And three guys saying, the best is between us. Help us to find it. So that was the innovation that helped a lot in that year. Well, sincerely, we were not prepared as a party for winning. Mm -hmm. So I perhaps we made some mistakes. Well, I clearly made some m m mistakes. One was remembering in a, in a meeting, in a big meeting of the Green Party, in the Congress, big uh, hall, I was saying, I expect this will not happen like in football. In football, sometimes someone has an opportunity to make a goal after a penalty, using a penalty. But in Colombia and Latin America, people sometimes shout, la votó, la votó, la votó. <laughs> so there were some kind of suicidal manifestations. Uh, and then people be, 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 be began to doubt, you, you really want to be president? Because if it, it's not a real deep, deep desire, you will not perhaps win. My option from philosophy was better giving responsibilities to people that do not want too much to, to be there. Some contention could be helpful. We are slowly uh, getting to the end, and uh, those who would like to, to, to continue, uh, please follow us to the open marathon room, which is another building, and then uh, Antanas also will speak uh, more about uh, how his practice could be possibly taken over by the other mayors of the city. And this is also an image that I remember where actually we met in Berlin last year for the first time, and you came to see an exhibition that the mayor of Berlin back then financed was called Base in Berlin. It was this kind of a, you know, end of the year exhibition to show the production and how much Berlin is this city with the presence of artists. And, uh, and uh, his way of presenting artists was basically renting five, four or five venues in Berlin and, and in kind of a gallery oriented model, uh, inviting also five curators to curate a show, uh, which didn't really have a links with Berlin. And then seeing together this show, we thought that actually maybe if uh, Klaus Wolverheide, the governing mayor of Berlin, would like to uh, treat artists present in Berlin seriously, he, who, he maybe should rather invite them to work with him in the city office or in some kind of a consultancy to create what I think you have uh, achieved to create, which is this social chain of reactions and having, of course, its role our own role of critical people and artists and cultural producers in the society, but being linked and having a practice which be taken over by the politicians. So this, I think, we'll speak about in another half, one an hour and a half in the Open Marathon. And now I thank you so much, Antanas. Yes, um,